All right. Right. So this project is um, is about global position estimation. And I'll start with a little bit of uh, background. So the thing is, motion capture has been uh, quite rapidly coming to the consumer market within the last few years. Um, the traditional domain of motion capture was large dedicated studios. Um, but recently advancements like uh, IMU based systems are changing quite a lot about how we can work with mocap and how we can use it. Um, so an IMU suit like Rococo Smart Suit Pro on the left here or on the slide here, um, it's available for under $3,000, which is a pretty sharp contrast to the more traditional optical, set, optical setups like the one on the right on the slide, which easily costs in the tens of thousands of dollars. And apart, apart from being financially quite attractive, these IMU suits have another big advantage, and that is that they're untethered. So as long as you can provide a stable wireless connection with the suit, your capture volume is uh, virtually unlimited. So all this has led to quite an increase in popularity when it comes to out alternative mode cap systems, um, especially among small studios and individual creators. So let's start with a bit of animation. These animations here were made uh, from raw data recorded with an IMU-based motion capture solution. And as you can see, the quality of these pose estimations is pretty good, but something is missing. The data produced with this system doesn't contain any notion of global translation. So you can see the characters are just suspended uh, in space. And the reason for this is that IMU sensors, are you, they, they are pretty good at measuring orientations but not so good at measuring position or displacement. So to give a bit more of a, an insight into, into the problem, IMU sensors do measure acceleration. And a naive approach could be to solve this, um, this global positioning problem by just integrating the acceleration signal. You could integrate the signal twice and then reconstruct the global displacement. Now, the problem here is that due to, for example, biases present in each sensor, um, this will introduce drift to the positional estimates. And that will eventually render this approach uh, practically unusable. So this is what I'm trying to show here in this slide, where you can, you can see that a very small uh, constant offset in the acceleration over not such a long time, like a time span of 10 seconds, uh, causes a drift in the position in meters. So that's five meters. That, that's, that's not practical for any motion capture um, solution. So to the best of our knowledge, current commercial solutions use heuristic-based methods to solve the global positioning problem. What these methods do is they obtain a global, uh, the global displacements by first estimating foot ground contact with the world and then locking and rotating the character with respect to these contact points. Although these, uh, these methods work pretty well for predictable cyclic motions like walking, they fail um, for less uh, they work much le less well for other motions specifically if you start running for example where you have a, a flight phase in motion um, so there's no contact with the world these kind of methods used to uh, break down so to to highlight this i have a few examples of some heuristic based methods so here you can see a character uh, doing some different types of motions. And as you can see, the walking works pretty well, but especially this violent onset um, to a run uh, that feels miserably. So in this work, we propose a data-driven solution to the global position estimation problem. 
We hypothesize that a short time window of post data contains enough dynamic information about the character to predict its global displacement. By leveraging the power of function approximators, such as neural networks, we can then learn a mapping between this local information and the global position, provided we have a large enough data, uh, data set, of course, to train them. So for example, a neural network could learn this mapping on a more abstract level than what is represented in these heuristic methods. And that way overcome some of the problems faced by uh, non-data driven techniques. So a little bit about the data that we've been using. Um, here you can see a, a bunch of examples of the data sets uh, that, we're, that we have used to train our models. So the raw data comes from Rococo's motion uh, library, which is a commercially available database and it contains a broad range of optical motion capture assets recorded by different studios uh, and different actors. So we chose optical motion data because it is readily available. We have a lot of it. And it contains the ground truth positions already that are necessary for training. So it can be easily transformed to an IMU-like representation by subtracting uh, the global positional information. Now the data contains a lot of different motions like walking, running, dancing, uh, among others. Our data set consisted of 577 different assets, uh, like the one shown here. And each asset was sampled at 100 frames per second. Each asset also comes as joint positions of a 19 skeleton joint, uh, joint skeleton in a global reference frame. For more information about the data, um, I can, I, I'd like to refer to the, to the paper where we describe it in a bit more detail. Now on this slide, you can see a schematic of our data flow. So the raw input data uh, flows through a pre-processing pipeline before it's finally fed to a neural network for training. I'm just going to go quickly step by step through these uh, different uh, parts of this, uh, this pre-processing pipeline. So the first step in the pre-processing um, is the windowing operation. In this operation, we take 64 consecutive frames uh, and collect them into what we call a window. So each window can be seen as a sort of a short animation of 64 frames itself. Our windows are created in a sliding manner and with a stride of one. So this means that each frame appears in 64 consecutive windows. Now, the input processing essentially consists of two steps. The first step is that we subtract the root position from our data to obtain joint uh, positions with respect to the character's root. This would be how the IMU uh, suit would see the data or, or would generate the data. Number. Now, the second step is to rot rotate the character into what we call a generic frame. And this step is important because the idea is that motion is essentially the same whether a character moves east or west or north or south. Um, so we, we want to get rid of that bit of uh, information. So what is le left is an animation of a character that is suspended by the pelvic bone. And this is what we use uh, as an input to a neural network. Now in the third part of our uh, processing pipeline, we calculate the targets for our network to learn. The first uh, step here is to compute the center of mass from all the individual joint positions. Uh, we opt for a center of mass over, for example, the pelvic bone position because it is less prone to irrelevant oscillations, such as the sway of the hips. We then reset the horizontal position of the center of mass uh, again to the origin. Um, of the, of, of the window. And finally, we rotate the target window into our generic frame, like we also did with the input windows. 
So on the previous slide, I mentioned that the horizontal root position is reset to the origin for each window. The effect of this is that we are estimating a displacement for each window rather than an absolute position. For the height of the character, this is different though, because here it actually makes sense to have an absolute estimate, because in the vast majority of cases, a character's height will be tightly coupled, coupled to skeleton kinematics. So this makes estimating the absolute height a feasible target. So a little bit about the neural network architecture that we chose. We chose to use a UNet architecture, and that might seem odd for people that are um, acquainted with uh, UNets because they're mostly used in image cl classification tasks. Um, the thing is, Pesle at all, they showed that units can actually also be uh, used pretty well for regression problems. So by making a few minor adjustments, they're capable to some extent of mi mimicking properties uh, of recurrent neural networks. And this makes them especially well suited for um, time series data. So our unit uses three encoder and decoder stages where the time scale of the input data is compressed and decompressed uh, respectively. UNet skip connections, which are these lines, uh, these lines here, here, and here. Uh, th they relay information at different temporal scales to the output, which is why they're so well suited for time series data. So here's, uh, let's go to some results. So what we see here is a comparison um, of the horizontal trajectory of a character walking along a straight line, as it is estimated by two different network types, as well as the ground truth in yellow. So the blue line is the trajectory estimated using our UNet architecture. The red line is the trajectory estimated using a more standard four layer convolutional network. And for details about this, I'd like to refer to the paper again. Um, and as you can see, the, the, the interesting thing is that uh, the unit predicts the trajectory with pretty good ac accuracy, while the other network has quite some overshoot. Um, now, since this is just a single example, this might ra raise a question of how general this result is. So in order to answer that, I want to refer to the second plot in the slide. Here we show a histogram of all the errors in the forward direction estimated um, by the UNet and uh, the, the other uh, convolution, the more standard convolutional neural network. And what you can see is that while the errors of the UNet are concentrated pretty nicely around zero, the 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 red line is slightly offset from zero has its peak a little bit away from zero and the result is that uh, it always kind of overestimates the uh, the the displacement and therefore this is this is this explains why the uh, red line in the first plot overshoot uh, quite overshoots while the blue line doesn't So here are some animations of our results. So what you see here on the right is the ground truth optical data. And on the left is, the, uh, if, is our approach where we have estimated the global displacement. So as you can see with this character running, the estimations are pretty good. The, the character um, displacement is in, uh, in sync in such a way that you don't see uh, a lot of foot, foot slide only on the in the end of it you see that it slides a little bit forward still after um, after the motion but this is something that can be quite is easily fixed with some pre, uh, post processing uh, food uh, uh, food skate fixing algorithms for example here we show zigzag motion which proves that our method is also capable of taking turns.
And this dancing example shows that our, our network is capable uh, of tracking motions with more complex non-cyclical food contacts. This unusual zombie walk is no problem either. Now, of course, there's also limitations to what our network can do. This example of a character falling shows that the prolonged fall and sliding motions are too much for our network. We blame this on a lack of motion on a joint level in these types of motions. So the result is that our network doesn't have any references to deduct global motion from. One thing uh, that could be done to, to help improve this would be adding acceleration data, for example, to the input of the neural network um, to add some more dynamic information. Note though how when he gets up, the prediction pretty quickly uh, recovers. So in conclusion, um, we presented a data-driven uh, data driven method that was successful in using a, Euro, a UNET neural network architecture to reconstruct global positions from short time windows of local post data. The UNET architecture showed better results than normal convolutional neural networks architectures. And we also showed that our network works for a variety of different uh, motions also beyond gate, such as dancing. Finally, an interesting case for the future could be to add dynamic information to the input. This could be done by adding joint acceleration or angular velocity signals, which could enable the network to learn highly dynamic behaviors, such as long flight phases uh, in the motion. Thank you all for listening. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.